Welcome viewers to this series of discussions, online discussion uh, around the European history and uh, I am Shankar Kumar, I teach at the Department of History, Hindu College, University of Delhi. Uh, I have spoken to you earlier about the rise of absolutist states uh, in Europe uh, and we have had uh, uh, several uh, general discussion uh, around uh, the phenomena of absolutism around 16th century, 17th century Europe. And uh, today uh, we are specifically uh, talking about the rise of absolutist state in France. Now this is uh, uh, the third in the sequence of discussion around absolutist state in France. And uh, in my earlier interaction I have spoken to you about the uh, general features or aspects of uh, French absolutism. Uh, we have spoken about the debate around the timing of uh, the French Revolution. Some historians regard it uh, to have begun around the 16th uh, century monarchies in France, whereas a majority of them tend to regard it uh, from the uh, adulthood period of Louis XIV and hence 1660s. Uh, and uh, in my earlier interaction, we have uh, spoken about the uh, several instruments like uh, bureaucracy, taxation, uh, judiciary, uh, judicial uh, layers of officials and new appointments uh, that were made uh, in order to uh, exercise uh, more and more royal power. And uh, all those things have been spoken of and in this particular interaction, uh, I would be specifically uh, talking about some of the personalities uh, who were extremely important in terms of their contribution, in terms of whatever they did across 16th and 17th centuries uh, to, uh, to further the cause of the emergence of absolutist states in France. And in this series of personalities, uh, we, uh, we will begin with uh, uh, Michel de uh, L. Hopital. And uh, he was a minister of uh, Charles uh, IX, who in general was regarded as a very weak ruler. And uh, uh, Michel de Hopital uh, uh, received a judgeship and became chancellor in 1560. So you know the timeline that we are speaking of. We are talking of almost the middle of the 16th century. This is the time when uh, in Europe you have a reformation movement uh, also happening and it is in that, it is in that milieu that you have uh, uh, furtherance of uh, or intensification of the uh, monarchical rule uh, not only uh, in France but elsewhere as well. And uh, as is evident, uh, this was the uh, time of religious wars and uh, therefore Hopital's uh, uh, major priority was to suppress this uh, corrupting morality of religious passion and self-interest. So there are fissiporous tendencies, there are uh, uh, centrifugal tendencies at work uh, uh, and, and uh, there is no collective thinking as such. And uh, th this is uh, morally also, uh, because we are talking of uh, 16th century, where individualism as a major idea is yet to crystallize as a political philosophy and so forth. And therefore, uh, such uh, instance of uh, uh, people thinking merely for themselves and not for the corporate or the collective was, was, uh, was uh, morally uh, not uh, looked at uh, in, in good taste and uh, it, it, was, it was regarded as some kind of a moral failing that people could not take people, uh, other people along uh, in, in, in their scheme of things. And he wanted to uh, suppress these uh, tendencies and uh, it, 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 is, it is under this justification that he goes on to lend a you know, lot of credence to any effort uh, made uh, at the behest of the monarch to intensify power because, because it was all done to you know to, to do away to weed out uh, things that are uh, that were uh, that were morally corrupting and so uh, th that's the way it unfolded so uh, what uh, hospital uh, suggests is uh, administrative and judicial reforms and uh, this has this had to come at the behest of the monarchy uh, just to instill a kind of faith in, in people's mind for the system because uh, uh, you know the kind of tendencies that were developing uh, 
uh, people had lost uh, any faith in the system of governance and therefore uh, the governance, uh, the mechanism, the uh, infrastructure of governance had to win back its credibility in people's mind. So that, that uh, worked as a good justification. So uh, that, that situation worked well for, uh, for uh, the monarchy to, uh, to expand and intensify its power. Uh, he, he sought to view the magisterial class, uh, which was part of the judiciary, uh, and it was it had been existing in France traditionally, but he views them not as rival of the state, but as part of the state. So there is an effort to incorporate, to co-opt the magisterial class that had traditionally uh, been existing. And uh, uh, if you, if uh, the monarchy did not have this kind of uh, uh, attitude towards uh, the magisterial class, maybe that they would have uh, uh, they would have uh, started to be viewed as uh, as a rival uh, to the upcoming state. But that's not the way uh, things unfolded. There was an attempt on part of the monarchy to uh, to win them over, to 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 treat the magisterial class as the uh, levers through which the absolutist monarchical control could be exercised, and. Uh, Hopital also opposed uh, auction of posts to check moral decline and efficiency uh, because uh, inefficiency sorry uh, this, this is something that uh, uh, we otherwise also know that uh, during uh, reformation uh, or uh, even uh, prior to it uh, uh, the church uh, also uh, used to sell several posts uh, and that could be bought almost as a commodity by uh, the people who had wealth. And by buying those uh, posts, uh, uh, people could aspire to become a nobility and hence by uh, and once they are part of the nobility, they would be immune from tax. So that's the way it went. And therefore, it was a corrupt system. It was it was uh, uh, it was part of the corruption uh, and uh, uh, otherwise uh, the post should have gone either uh, from uh, that uh, point of uh, from that times. Uh, ideology, it could have uh, gone to the kin group of the monarch or uh, they could have used the uh, parameter of uh, meritocracy to appoint people. Anyway, so that was not happening and uh, th there was abuse of this and uh, therefore th this uh, uh, corrupt system had crept in and uh, the monarchy uh, of uh, 16th century is viewed uh, as trying to check this corrupt system. So, uh, in, in public, uh, uh, public opinion, uh, uh, the, the monarchy is, is uh, somewhat uh, situated uh, in a rather uh, appropriate, uh, uh, you can say, vantage point to undertake measures to intensify and uh, expand its power. Uh, uh, Hopital also wanted to use the Paris Parliament to execute his ideas, as I have spoken to you earlier, that uh, parliaments uh, in, in uh, France uh, were traditionally there, right? And uh, uh, they were the ones who looked after the provincial matters and so forth. And uh, on national deliberations, there was this, uh, uh, there was this tradition of consulting them as well. And uh, Hopital is trying to use this institution of uh, traditional uh, uh, parliaments to execute his ideas. Uh, uh, although uh, in this effort, he, uh, he met with a lot of resistance because uh, the parliaments were just not willing to lose power to the upcoming monarchies. They, they saw the monarchy as an uh, adversary uh, who, who, uh, which is there. Uh, to uh, to uh, you know encroach upon uh, the traditional powers that the uh, parliaments had been enjoying in France. Uh, Hopital is credited with uh, the work uh, treatise on the uh, reformation of justice. Uh, as I told you that uh, his intervention is majorly in the realm of uh, justice and jurisprudence and so forth. Uh, the institution of uh, uh, juris uh, jurisprudence and justice. Uh, it, it, it sought to uh, leverage the spirit of nationalism to increase centralization by making a central code. So uh, in, in this, uh, he talks about the need to have a central code of, uh, 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 you know, rules uh, that should be adhered to 
uh, he, he uh, in fact tries to sell centralization as an idea. Uh, uh, mounting on the spirit of nationalism, which was uh, very much evident because France was uh, at war with with uh, uh, several, with several countries uh, not long ago, and uh, therefore uh, th this is how he is trying to pitch with the pitch in with the idea of uh, absolutism and the desirability of a, a centralized power at the helm. Uh, Hopital is also credited with developing a system of examining the merits of candidates and this uh, as I just told you that uh, this went well with the idea of good governance and uh, only uh, uh, those who are uh, actually able uh, and efficient uh, could administer and uh, this went against uh, the system of sale of offices which was a corrupt practice. So, uh, uh, efforts were made to uh, uh, for, for control of state's power over the nobility uh, and uh, the consequent expansion of bureaucracy. Nobility uh, had been exercising power in the local affairs, uh, in th their areas and that uh, power had to be uh, had to be cut into in order to uh, you know exercise a uh, a more formidable central presence which is uh, what absolutism is all about and uh, this could happen only when uh, the centrally appointed bureaucrats uh, could uh, actually replace uh, 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 the, the power that was earlier shared by the nobility and nobility of course would, would resist this uh, but how and uh, how and when uh, this happened is something that uh, we are talking about. So, uh, uh, Hopital uh, made efforts to, to expand bureaucracy, central bureaucracy uh, at the cost of uh, exercise of power uh, traditionally by the nobility. Uh, however, if you critically look at uh, whatever work he did, uh, his works are uh, criticized as plethora of legislation because it was uh, it was more about uh, you know idealized uh, situation that he was writing about to what extent actually it could fructify in in uh, 16th century uh, is a matter of debate uh, so it looks uh, that he had so many prescriptions to offer uh, but uh, historically uh, how it uh, actually fructified during his time is is something that is not very clear and uh, in fact uh, 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 despite all these efforts uh, religious disturbances couldn't quite be checked and we have the example of the massacre of uh, huguenots uh, in 1597 despite uh, attempt, uh, attempt uh, made by hospital uh, to uh, to check the religious strife and uh, uh, corrupt practices that had uh, crept into. Another uh, personality uh, very much associated with uh, the French absolutism is Richelieu and Richelieu was uh, uh, the cardinal under Louis XIII and uh, he uh, his role is, is uh, obviously uh, greatly embellished uh, in, in uh, French absolutism and uh, uh, basically he is credited with uh, uh, developing mercantilist policy of France and you all know as to what mercantilist policy uh, was all about. It was uh, almost uh, as a, uh, an idea or ideology that uh, guaranteed uh, or that uh, suggested that the state uh, should actively support uh, the economic pursuits of uh, uh, its traders and uh, commercial people. Uh, because they are uh, actually getting gold and silver bullions from uh, outside into their country and uh, it, it is the uh, golden bullion uh, uh, which, which, which uh, enhanced the economic uh, perception of uh, a particular country. So, uh, it, it was that kind of uh, ideology uh, that was developed and Richelieu's uh, uh, role in this is, is uh, formidable. Uh, and, and as you can uh, uh, very easily uh, argue that uh, if you have this kind of an ideology, it is a very good ideology for any uh, upcoming uh, monarch uh, to, to be absolutist because uh, uh, you, you have uh, at the level of an idea which, uh, which uh, actually pushes a monarch to 
intervene in the matters of uh, trade and commercial uh, enterprise and conflicts and so forth with uh, with the mandate of uh, you know some kind of a national intervention that uh, this is good for the nation therefore uh, uh, the king should actively intervene in those matters and uh, when uh, you have such direct uh, justified or uh, ideologically justified uh, intervention by the state in uh, economic affairs which earlier were more individualized or uh, more uh, you know localized uh, so that uh, in effect gave lot of uh, power to uh, or, or it, uh, it it increased uh, the power and prestige of uh, the monarchy and that is what uh, uh, is the story of uh, of absolutism so uh, at his uh, uh, behest uh, the monarchy could successfully weaken the nobility by taking away their political powers and converting them as pillars of absolutism. So, uh, the negotiations that were happening, the constant negotiations across several monarchies in 16th and 17th century French history is about how a monarch handles the nobility who had earlier been exercising power and uh, at it, it is at the cost of their power exercise that the absolutist monarch had to emerge. So, usually what happened is that the nobility was uh, lured into uh, participation uh, in the monarchical affairs uh, and uh, their political powers were uh, actually uh, taken by the monarch and they uh, did not do much uh, to alter their, uh, their social esteem or their uh, uh, you know other uh, privileges uh, that occurred to them and that is why uh, absolutist monarchies uh, did not alter the feudal social or signorial relations as such between the peasant and the feudal lords, but it mounted itself over the existing system as, as a formidable uh, you know, uh, mechanism of governance, as a formidable apparatus of uh, uh, politics and governance. So, uh, that uh, tells you uh, the underbelly, that tells you about the underbelly of, of uh, the uh, French uh, absolutist uh, monarchy. Uh, so, uh, the provincial institutions uh, uh, that were there uh, in, in France, uh, the central authority of absolutist monarchy had to be uh, grafted over the provincial institutions and uh, uh, Richelieu uh, could, could do this or, or could uh, make or was, was seen as making efforts to do that. And uh, it is uh, after these two uh, people, uh, personalities, that we have uh, the emergence of Louis XIV, the iconic French ruler uh, who, who is regarded to have said uh, that I am the state. And that is the oft quoted uh, uh, sentence by Louis XIV. Uh, and uh, that uh, almost uh, is the flagship uh, quote uh, of uh, French. Uh, uh, absolutism and that makes uh, French absolutism al almost as a classical case. Now, uh, the earlier period of Louis XIV's accession as uh, the king uh, was uh, the period of uh, minority in the sense that he was a minor uh, till around 1661. So, 1643 to 16 uh, 1661, Louis XIV is a minor and once he becomes an adult, uh, uh, he comes into his own and during his uh, period of uh, minority. It is the royal mother Anne uh, who was from Austria and the cardinal uh, Mazarin who uh, actually ran the show. But on attaining adulthood, uh, Louis XIV successfully put down uh, the most uh, important of the incidents that is associated with uh, exercise of monarchical power or uh, absolutist power of the monarch and that is the Fronde, revol uh, Fronde revolt or Fronde rebellion. Uh, uh, from the rebellion actually was a rebellion by the uh, upper echelons of the nobility against the upcoming monarchy. Uh, they, they resented this idea of interference by the monarchy uh, ag against uh, these and uh, they wanted uh, uh, greater uh, uh, autonomy for them. Uh, but uh, Louis XIV could successfully uh, handle this and defeat them. 
and that uh, gave uh, a different kind of aura to Louis XIV and this marked the peak of the French absolutism. 1660 to 1680 is, is uh, uh, the peak of French absolutism and it is during this period that Louis declared that I am the state and used even the divine uh, theory of kingship, used the symbol of sun to project himself as, uh, uh, as, as a king by the grace of God. And uh, uh, in this effort, uh, he was greatly aided by uh, his minister, uh, Colbert. Uh, and uh, he was, Colbert was very uh, enthusiastic in implementing royal authority and mercantilist policy. And therefore, it is also, his policies are also known as Colbertism. And uh, he took a number of uh, economic projects, uh, development of French Navy uh, to strengthen uh, militarily. Uh, um, uh, conventionally, it was only in the army that uh, French, was, uh, French monarchy was excelling. Now, uh, greater uh, uh, efforts were made even in the domain of Navy. And that was important for furthering the mercantilist policy for trade and commerce. Uh, there, there is a lot of effort on part of Colbert. To, uh, to make the taxation structure more formidable and strong and that was critical to uh, revenue, uh, revenue collection. Uh, he set up several industries and arsenals, particularly to back army and navy of France. That was very important to, to back all these uh, you know, uh, interventions that uh, absolutist monarchies were making. He favored economic regulation for control of trade and commerce that goes uh, well with mercantilist policy. And he also made effort in the domain of science and technology to connect the Mediterranean Sea with uh, Atlantic uh, by building a canal. And so uh, all these things are there as part of uh, Colbert's design. He favored dominance of uh, central power over the uh, provincial powers. And this we have discussed earlier. He, and overall, he is guided more by pragmatism than innovation. Uh, and that is, uh, that is how John Law uh, uh, tries to assess uh, uh, the French absolutism that the new form of centralized state that emerged by 1660s, however, didn't quite fundamentally alter the existing social order in France. It was superimposed on the existing social and political order. And this is something that I have already spoken to you about uh, while, while highlighting the feudal nature of uh, the French uh, absolutist monarchies. It, it, uh, it did nothing to destroy the, uh, the feudal uh, relations uh, that was there uh, between the uh, French peasantry and the feudal lords. Uh, for example, uh, the Ita General that was there, which could have uh, actually played a, a greater role, was never convened between 1641 and, 16, uh, and 1789, uh, almost at the eve of the French Revolution, but it wasn't abolished either. Similarly, parliaments weren't allowed to intervene uh, on big national issues, so overall it remained very conservative. Uh, so far as uh, uh, so far as the uh, overall structure is concerned, governors were linked to the royal place, and in that place you have intendants, and that uh, became the pillar of uh, absolutism. Towns had lo lost much of their uh, autonomy and independence because mayors' posts were sold, and usually bought uh, by pro absolutists. Usually, intendants were the ones who bought it. Middle class supported absolutism because by buying these positions, they could aspire to become nobles, and once they become nobles, they are immune from uh, taxes. So the overall number of nobility increased but their political power declined during uh, absolutism king's legislative power which was earlier confined to his own region of course expanded to other areas so that is how uh, uh, absolutist uh, monarchies expanded churches privileges of taxation was retained but now they had to pay block grants after every 10 years to the state so all these things tell you that uh, uh, it, it was more of a kind of change from above and there is no real, uh, you know, uh, fundamental altering of uh, the social and economic rela uh, relations from within. Number of wars in Louis XIV's period fostered a sense of nationalism because he fought a lot of war and that, uh, uh, you know, uh, solidified the sense of nationalism and that uh, aided his uh, centralization bid and uh, France was also projected as a world power. And there were several uh, soft uh, uh, measures taken to uh, uh, highlight French language as a, uh, a soft language, as a diplomatic language, as a sophisticated language and uh, uh, projections in the field of uh, literature and so forth. Uh, that also gave a different kind of projection to, uh, uh, to the French monarchy and that helped 
the the uh, the uh, total uh, or overall uh, steam political steam of uh, French absolutist monarch. So that is how uh, overall we can make a sense of the uh, French uh, monarchies. But as I told you that uh, it was always in doldrums and economically it was not very stable, taxation structure was very faulty and all those things came to light uh, around 1789 uh, when uh, you have uh, the French revolution that dismantled uh, the old regime altogether. So that is it uh, uh, for the day. Thank you.